So before starting an analysis, before jumping into the well testing tools, there are some couple of things to consider. And one of them is the type of well. We need to understand the deviation. We need to understand what type of wells we've got. Have we got a vertical well, a deviated well, an horizontal well? And not only do you need to have a look at the deviation angle with respect to the vertical plane, but you also need to look at the deviation angle with respect to the normal of the bedding plane. Have a look at the cross section. Okay. For example, here, we've got our well in red. And the deviation angle with respect to the vertical is about, let's say, 45 degrees. And when you look at this deviation, this well has been drilled following the bedding plane. And this well will act as an horizontal well in the reservoir. We need to have a look at the perforated interval. Is the well fully perforated? Or have we got a limited perforation? Do we expect three-dimensional flow across the um, perforation interval? Has the well been acidized? Do we expect a near well bore region at an improved cage? Translating that into well test analysis, do we expect a composite behavior? Do we expect different regions in the reservoir at different permeability? Has the well been fractured mechanically? So do we expect a fracture behavior early on? A word of caution with water injectors. Although the walls might not have been fractured mechanically, you might have some thermally induced fractures. So as you inject cold water into a warm or hot reservoir, fractures might be created near the well bore due to thermal effects. So you might deal with an open frack now. And the open frack size and therefore the dollar scheme are going to change with the injection pressure. We need to have a look at the type of uh, reservoir, the lithology and the layers. Are we dealing with a sandstone reservoir or carbonate? If it is a carbonate, we might expect some natural fractures. We might expect maybe some changes in um, reservoir properties according to the changes in fracture density. Uh, we might have multi-layers. Have we got any contrast in permeability or in reservoir properties, in thickness between these different layers? Have we got some layers which are not perforated? This could add some multi-layer effect. We need to consider the type of reservoir mechanism. We've got natural depletions. Is that water fluid we are dealing with? Bubble and dew point pressure. We need to know the saturation pressure. We need to know whether the wall pressure is below that saturation pressure whether we are creating a gas breakout or liquid dropout, so a multi-phase region near the well bore. How many phases in uh, the well bore? Have we got any risk of well bore phase or dissolution? That will impact and corrupt the data. We've got any phases, different phases in the reservoir? Are we dealing with a multi-phase analysis study? Or have we got any dominant phase and we can neglect the other one and we can keep doing a single phase analysis study? What is the depth of the pressure gauge? Is what both is the solution a risk? Have we got different gauges in the tubing? Can we track the fluid movements? Can we track the density change between the gauges? Any wells nearby? Do we expect interference? Any fluid contacts? And as well, we need to consider the well history. We need to consider the entire production data. We need to make sure that we are using all the possible data. And it's quite a good practice to go back to earlier PVs and try to understand the story behind the well. Try to understand from day one what's happening. Try to understand the type of response. This is going to help you to do whatever you want to do later on with later PBs. Okay, next step is to explore the data using some particular techniques and using the well testing tools. So we've got the data plot showing the pressure and the rate versus time. The superposition plot showing the pressure versus the superposition time. And the derivative plot or log log plot showing the delta P plot, okay, this pressure signal, and its derivative with respect to the superposition time. And you plot this in log log scale for both axes and versus the shutting duration. What you want to do is a derivative overlay. You want to compare the different PBU tests on the same plot. This is going to give you some confidence in the data. By doing this, we'll be able to check the rate consistency. 
you will be able to detect some bad quality data that you can remove. Then you can investigate the validity of the convolution, provided you got two PBUs. The convolution, again, is going to help you to refine the initial pressure. You're going to see it further away in the reservoir, and you're going to get a pure signal free of any errors. So once you've got clean data from the PBUs, then you can investigate validity of the convolution. Once you've got the deconvolve response, you can overlay the deconvolve response with the conventional derivative, which is what we did here. We've got conventional response up to this point, and here what you see in blue and red is the deconvolution. This is one of the most important steps at this stage. Try to get an overlay of the conventional derivative and the convolution. So it's going to be easier for you to detect the different flow regimes, and you're going to identify the possible well and reservoir response. So now the next step is to recover the information from the data. So we're going to use the techniques and the tools to recover information from this data. The first thing you can do is a straight line analysis. So you can spot the different slots with straight lines. So as I did here, for example, with bubble storage, I've got my one unit slope straight line. This is going to give you the wall bar storage coefficient. I've got my stabilization line. So I detect the radio flow regime at this point. This is going to give you the cage, the skin with the vertical separation, and the radius of investigation. And I spot the boundaries at late time further away from the wall, with this increase in the derivative. So that's going to give you some estimates of the wall and the reservoir response. But you can push the analysis further with a type curve simulation. So as you've got the convolution, now the convolution is going to be the driving tool for your analysis and for your simulation. Okay, so what you need to make sure is to match your data to the deconvolution. And then you're going to use the other tools as verification tools. You need to make sure that your model match the other tools as well. So the conventional derivative, as I did here, the superposition plot and the data plot. On the data plot, you need to make sure that the PBUs are matched. If they are not, you need to understand why. It could be because you got a wrong cage or wrong initial pressure, or you need to add, remove some boundaries, or you need to add some changes in reservoir properties. Once you're happy with the PBUs, you can have a look at the production period, and that's going to give you some information about the skin. So in this case, for example, we are saying that in our model, we are overestimating the pressure during um, flowing production. So our skin in our analytical model is too low. Okay, so at this point, the wall is getting more damage. The next two points are probably the most important message I can give you at this stage. Always try to use the simplest wild reservoir models. Okay, Always try to use the simplest wild reservoir models. And then if you want to use any uh, or investigate any fancy complex models, you can do that later on. What is interesting with analytical wild testing is that you can understand very complex behavior with very simple tools and very simple models. So it's very powerful. The other thing about this is that although reservoirs might have a very complex description when you look at the logs or when you look at the cores, most reservoirs will have a very simple dynamic flow behavior. Even though you've got very complex reservoirs or with different layers, a very complex log description, very complex core description, most reservoirs, let's say 95% of the reservoirs, will have a very simple flow dynamic behavior. So we lacked as a very simple well reservoir model, okay, with one layer and a uniform cage. So always start with the simplest well reservoir model first. It's going to help you to understand better the response. And it's going to give you a very simple but powerful way to understand what's going on. And then you can implement later on a more complex models. The second very important point is this one. The choice of the type of model is more critical than the match. Okay. It's better to have the right and the appropriate interpretation model and an average match than to have the inverse, an excellent match, but a non-relevant model, okay? It's gonna be useless. If your model is not relevant, 
it's um, it's not appropriate. What we've seen uh, a couple of times is that for a slightly deviated wall, some of us may want to use the horizontal wall. And the reason for that is because with an horizontal wall model, you've got so much parameters to play with that it's quite easy to match the data. But if it is a vertical or a slightly deviated wall, there is no point in using an horizontal wall model. Okay? You're just wasting your time. The well and reservoir parameters are not going to be correct. Okay, so again, the choice of the type of model is far way more important than the match. Okay, and sometimes with an analytical model, you cannot match all the response and you need to understand why. Again, don't forget that all this process is non-unique. Okay, so you got non-uniqueness. So don't give only one solution, right? Even if you integrate with other sources of information, don't give only one solution. Try the best you can to give more than one solution. And non-uniqueness mainly is going to come from the use of interpretation model, and especially a combination of heterogeneity and boundaries. The next step is to integrate the results with the subsurface and wall information. So you can use the log and the core, you can compare the cage derived from the log and the core with the cage derived from the well test analysis. Sometimes it won't be consistent, and that's fine. You know, the log and the core are looking at a couple of feet away from the wall, while well test analysis is looking at kilometers away from the wall. You need to make sure that your rate contribution per layer are the same as the one that you observe in the PLT. So, for example, if you're using a multi-layer model and you observe a non-uniform rate contribution across the layers, your rate contribution per layer in your model needs to match what you've got on the PLT. You can use the seismic as well. Even if you don't see a particular fault on the seismic, that doesn't mean that the fault is not there. Then you can compare also the different test results from other worlds. Okay, and that, that may help you as well to spot if you've got any issues.